thank you very much to uh, Derek and John for getting my topic just right in terms of my interests. Uh, the topic of cardiovascular prevention is very close to my heart. It's a perfect topic to be discussing at the end of a challenging day. The concepts are intuitive, they're easy to understand. We're nowhere near the limits in terms of our ability to apply cardiovascular, effectively, cardiovascular prevention effectively in the population or for individuals. And the impact it will have is on all of us in this room, our patients, and indeed the societies in which we live. So I'm going to start off with the story where we were in the United Kingdom a few years ago in the 1990s when we were top of the league in terms of cardiovascular disease in Europe and one of the highest in the world. Our government was fed up with this and actually made a very really, a good decision to invest in cardiovascular disease treatment in the UK. And they set an ambitious target for cardiovascular disease prevention, uh, targeting a 40% reduction over the next few years. And in fact, remarkably for a government program, we exceeded that target significantly. And over the next 20 years, cardiovascular disease mortality has fallen around 65% in the United Kingdom. Now, the sharp-eyed amongst you, if you're not too tired, will have probably worked out that if this trend was to continue, immortality would be guaranteed to all of us by 2026. And unfortunately, I'm sad to tell you that's not the case. And actually, we've reached a very interesting moment in the UK, because these are data that were published at the end of the last year for UK life expectancy. And we seem to have hit an inflection point in what's happened over the last 20 or 30 years. You can see here the change in life expectancy in weeks in men and women since 2002 up to the current era, so that every year that went by, there was an increase in life expectancy in the population due to probably better medical care. But look what's happened since 2011. That expected increase that we were getting so used to has disappeared completely and we may be crossing the line so that in the future years to come, the population will have a shorter life expectancy than the previous ones rather than a longer one. And we have to ask ourselves a question, why is that occurring? Well, almost certainly, it's because we now have an unfavorable balance between what we can do for patients as medical practitioners and what's happening to the health of the population due to their societal situation, due to their behavior, and due to the accumulation of cardiovascular risk factors. So we're out here as practitioners, by and large, treating the clinical consequences of atherosclerosis, and seeing patients when they come to us, usually from their 50s and onwards, with clinical events like myocardial infarction, heart failure, stroke, and the like. And when we engage in that, we have expensive treatments, we treat their acute event, and we talk to our patients about the risk up front and what they need to do in terms of their treatment. I'm going to suggest to you that the big change, the revolutionary change in our thinking, is going to be that we have to take into account what we might have been able to do during that long preclinical phase during which atherosclerosis is developing, which has an, an enormous impact on the future health of the population and what might be an opportunity that is lost in our current medical treatment. So my three points I'd like to make to you in this presentation are that we need to think about lifetime cardiovascular risk reduction, and I call it investing in your arteries. We have to start to think that prevention is important because reduced lifetime exposure to risk factors leads to less atherosclerosis and future cardiovascular events. I'm going to show you evidence to support that. Equally importantly, lower cardiovascular risk factor exposure over time benefits not just cardiovascular outcomes, but multiple diseases of aging, because they share common pathways towards disease. Dementia, diabetes, cancer, all relate to the same inflammatory and biological pathways that are driving cardiovascular disease. And finally, I'm going to suggest to you that with precision medicine, we can refine prevention strategies much more effectively than we've been able to do in the past. Now, why are we talking about prevention in 2019 when this concept is so obvious and has been around since Erasmus in the 16th century? 
Well, the reason we're talking about it now is there is an economic imperative to do something about it. We cannot afford to continue to practice medicine the way we're currently doing. Secondly, our understanding of disease that I'm going to show you suggests that there is a tremendous opportunity to modify early life factors that are driving the development of atherosclerosis, not from your 50s, 60s, and 70s, but from birth and even from fetal age. And finally, we're in a digital era when technology advances really are going to enable us to deliver this type of program, not just for individual patients, but also at scale in the population. So these are recent Deloitte figures about the global healthcare outlook in terms of cost around the world. $10 trillion to deal with global healthcare by 2022. The health, annual growth in the healthcare budget has gone up from 2.9% increase per year up to 2017, and has almost doubled and is projected to double by 2022. That's because we're all older, we're winning the fight against communicable diseases, but we're losing the fight against non-communicable diseases like diabetes, heart disease, dementia, and cancer. So cardiovascular prevention is absolutely crucial. Strasser, in 1978, coined the term primordial prevention to describe a strategy to try to prevent risk factors getting in to an otherwise healthy population. And this relates to a whole range of potential interventions, getting city planning right, getting environment right, getting physical activity better, all these things to prevent the development of risk factors. What we traditionally call primary prevention is the management of those cardiovascular and other risk factors before they're associated with clinical disease. And finally, secondary prevention out here is managing the damaging consequences of the heart disease that the patient has accumulated over the years. While these are nice ideas, my view is that these can really be combined together to support the idea of early management of disease because there's so much overlap between strategies for primary prevention and what Strasser called primordial prevention. One of the reasons for combining them together is pretty well all of us in this room already have a degree of atherosclerosis. We've known this from autopsy studies of children for many years, but interestingly, when uh, Murat Tuju was working with Steve Nissen at the Cleveland Clinic, he looked at this in terms of imaging the coronary arteries of young people in the United States who had died of non-cardiac related causes, whose hearts were being used in the Cleveland Clinic heart transplant program. This is not transplant related coronary disease. What we're going to talk about here is the coronary arteries of the hearts going into the recipients. Take a look on the left here. This is a 32-year-old woman who died in a car accident near Cleveland. Here's the IVUS, intravascular ultrasound catheter. Here's the coronary artery. Then you see this asymptomatic 32-year-old has a rather impressive atherosclerotic plaque already present in her coronary circulation. Notice that these plaques are developing silently, not by encroaching on the lumen of the artery, which they only do much later, but by remodeling the arterial wall outwards for many years before they become clinically apparent. If this woman had just happened to have a coronary arteriogram before she died, it would have looked entirely normal. Now we could speculate how many of you in this audience today already have coronary arteries that look like this. Actually, you don't have to speculate too much because if you now look at this right-hand panel, these are the results of around 300 people dying in the United States at different ages of non-cardiac related diseases, looking at the presence of atherosclerosis as imaged in this way. Notice that about one in five teenagers already have early atherosclerotic plaques. And rather worryingly for many of us here today, including myself, by the time you hit 50, 85% of the hearts they examined had multiple atherosclerotic lesions in their coronary circulations. So I would suggest that many of us, if not all of us, are on this rather steep slope to developing substantial amount of this disease in our circulations, which is going to underpin the clinical events that we may suffer in later life. And we need to be asking not only what can we do about later disease to reduce its risk, but ask ourselves what might we be able to do to stop 
the initiation and slow the progression of this disease during this very long preclinical period. Now, it turns out that all the familiar cardiovascular risk factors that we know are associated with adverse outcome in later life are involved in driving that preclinical atherosclerosis, and they do so from childhood. Now, one of the key questions then is to ask what is the relationship between these various cardiovascular risk factors that we're exposed to for many years and the future risk of having a cardiovascular event? This is precisely the question that Donald Lloyd-Jones sought to answer by going back to the Framingham Heart Study. He asked a very simple question. He said, what was the relationship between the risk factor profile in people at the age of 50 and their future cardiovascular outcome? You can see that in Framingham, if you were a man and you were able to get to 50 with all of your risk factors in decent shape, your future chance of having a cardiovascular event was around 5%. On the other hand, if you got to 50 with two or more of your major cardiovascular risk factors at above optimal levels, that future risk rose to around 69%. You could argue then it's all over by the age of 50. The die is already cast in terms of your future cardiovascular outcome. What this really supports, though, is the idea that interaction between risk factors during the first 50 years of our life not only drives atherosclerosis, but determines our future clinical outcome. Now, I would love to be able to stand here and do a randomized clinical trial that Mark Pfeffer was talking about this morning and prove to you that lowering your risk factors from early life would prevent those future cardiovascular events. And of course, this would be extremely challenging, if not impossible. But it's here that genetics have really helped us understand, through Mendelian randomization and the like, the causal pathway that drives the development of atherosclerosis. This was Brian Ferencz's meta-analysis of several clinical trials of more than 100,000 people, in which there were 14,000 major vascular events. And all of these people had been genotyped in terms of risk scores for cholesterol and blood pressure. What you can see here is that individuals who had favorable blood pressure genetic scores had modestly lower blood pressure, very small effects from these multiple genes. And yet, if you had a score below the median, you had about a 20% reduction in future cardiovascular events. If you look at cholesterol, the situation is very similar. Modest lowering of cholesterol by being below the uh, polygenic risk score for LDL cholesterol, almost a 25% further LDL cholesterol lowering. And if you were lucky enough to inherit good genes for your blood pressure together with good genes for your cholesterol, your risk factor levels would only be a little bit reduced, but they would be reduced for the whole of your life. And that would be associated with an almost halving of your future cardiovascular risk a huge impact because of exposure being lower over the whole of your life. So we could argue then that arterial disease causing heart attacks and strokes might actually be largely preventable by relatively small changes in risk factors that is driving this problem, but sustaining that lowering over your whole life. When we see patients, we talk about it being never too late to do something about their arterial disease. I would argue that what we should be saying it's never too early to do something about your future cardiovascular risk. Now, I'm going to put this slide in. I put this slide in just to make the point that it doesn't actually start at birth. There is primordial prevention related to exposure to risk factors in the environment that you, you are exposed to as a fetus. This is really interesting work about the potential for your fetal environment to program the future cardiovascular risk of children in terms of risk of stroke, risk of heart attack, and risk of other diseases. So it may well be that obese mothers or diabetic mothers drive programming in their fetuses to result in an increase in obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. And those increases are then transmitted to the next generation. This is a really uh, adverse, potentially forward feedback loop that could be responsible for deteriorating risk in the population. Even if you don't buy into this fetal concept, and, but you buy into early intervention, what we now have to think about is how early should we be thinking about cardiovascular risk reduction? And I'm going to convince you that it is the 
children that we should be targeting aggressively in terms of strategies to help their future cardiovascular risk. Because there already is a generation of overweight children out there who are at risk of premature cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, and diabetes. These were shocking statistics that were published a couple of years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at the fate of children who are overweight and obese at the age of two. In the United States, if you're fat and overweight at the age of two, you have about an 80 to 85% chance of being obese with a BMI over 30 at the age of 35. These overweight children become overweight young adults exposed for decades to the adverse effects of adiposity and their medical consequences. And we know what's gonna to happen to these young people who are overweight from early life. This is a prospective study published in, again in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at the cumulative mortality for cardiovascular disease from these overweight and obese adolescents. And you can see the impact over the 40 years on these young individuals. And almost all the increase in cardiovascular risk was driven by the development of diabetes and hypertension. Now, we've got to do something about this, and strategies are being developed to try to target the behavior of young people. This was an interesting paper from New York, published just a couple of months ago in Jack from Val Fuster's group, where they went to deprived communities in Harlem in New York and developed a sort of interventional strategy to try to target awareness, not of adults, but actually of the children themselves. They went into the schools and the like, and they were able to show that understanding of future medical problems in these young people could be enhanced by this targeted approach. And of course, this is a long way from developing a, an interventional program that is effective, but it's the beginning of a different strategy for cardiovascular risk in the future. The prize is big. This is a paper, again in the New England Journal, combining the Bogalusa Heart Study from the United States and the Young Finn Study from Finland, where they looked at childhood adiposity, adult adiposity, and the relationship with cardiovascular risk factors. They were able to show that the overweight and obese children had markedly increased cardiovascular risk factors in adult life, but if they lost weight in the first 10 years of life, their cardiovascular risk profile was exactly the same as the children who had been slim and normal weight throughout their life. So this is a reversible problem if targeted early. Now the second real bang for your buck, the second big opportunity I want to describe to you is the fact that if you do something about these various risk factors early, you don't just gain benefit in terms of heart disease, morbidity and mortality, but you gain benefit across a whole range of non-communicable diseases of aging. Cholesterol, obesity, stress, blood pressure, smoking, all drive aging-related diseases, often through common pathways of inflammation, oxidative stress, and the like. So that if you're able to target early life risk factors effectively, not only will you get a benefit on one of these, but you're likely to see a benefit on all of these other diseases as well. Obesity is linked to cancer, it's linked to heart disease, dementia, diabetes, stroke, all of them can be targeted. Probably the most dramatic example of this is the realization that those cardiovascular risk factors are really important in determining your future cognitive status and your risk of dementia. What we know now is that the risk factors that drive heart disease also drive cognitive decline, and that interventions that protect your cardiovascular system might actually be protecting you from future cognitive decline. Look at these data from the, an HMO study in the United States looking at a large population of people aged between 40 and 43 years in terms of their risk factors for and hazard for midlife uh, cognitive decline and dementia. Look at the risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol and smoking, all the usual suspects that we know drive the development of cardiovascular disease associated with an increased risk of future dementia. Notice also that if they get combined, as they often do, the risk goes up in just the same way as we know happens for cardiovascular risk in the future. This represents a tremendous opportunity to modify the trajectory to cognitive decline and future dementia, something that is very important for our healthcare providers, our politicians, and indeed the public. But you've got to do something about it early 
just as we've seen has to happen for cardiovascular disease. These are really provocative data from the Young Finn study, looking at cognitive function in middle life and uh, midlife levels of risk factors and risk factors in teenagers. You can see that cognitive function in midlife was not impacted significantly by the level of risk factors present in your 40s and 50s. The biggest driver of cognitive decline in future life was the risk factor profile in the young, in teenage years. If you had risk factors present untreated in the young, there was a substantial increase in your risk of having cognitive dysfunction in midlife. This is an early problem that we have to tackle early for future gain. It's a bit like saving for your retirement. You wouldn't think about starting to save when you were 64 and hoping to be financially well off at 65 and older. And yet that's how we practice preventative medicine and cardiology at the moment. We have to move our activities right upstream if we're going to make a big impact. Now, if you buy into this idea that early intervention will prevent future problems, we have to take that knowledge and communicate it to our patients and to the public. Because unless we can empower them to understand and take control of their own cardiovascular health, we're not going to win this battle. Now, let's look at the way in which we communicate cardiovascular risk to patients. Pretty well every guideline that's out there for the decision-making around treatment, including statins and blood pressure treatments, uses a 10-year absolute risk metric to decide whether or not to treat the patients. In the UK, we've reduced our uh, level for treatment with statins to 10%, 10-year risk. The United States have been more aggressive and have reduced it from 20% to 7.5%. Let's take a look at one of these typical tables we often use in clinical practice. This is age, these are women, these are men, this is blood pressure, and this is cholesterol. You'll see immediately that you can be a 50-year-old woman, have a blood pressure of 180, and a cholesterol of eight, and be well below any of the thresholds that mandate intervention. On the other hand, if you're like me, and you're an elderly man, it doesn't really matter what your risk factors are, just by being male and just by being old, you'll have a, a threshold of 10-year risk that mandates an intervention. What does this do? It disenfranchises the young, and especially women, from getting effective cardiovascular risk factor interventional advice something we're dying to do if we're going to improve the future health of the population. Now, if you've decided that many people could get benefit from statins and other treatment, but the current thresholds of 10-year risk don't allow us to do that, what you can do is what we've just done, is to just lower the bar and say we're going to introduce these drugs at a lower 10-year risk. These are data that came out in the United States shortly after the change in policy demonstrating the impact of lowering the 10-year risk threshold from 20 to 7.5%. It would result in about 56 million additional people in the United States being offered a statin for cardiovascular prevention. Sounds good if you believe statins are good, but look at the type of people that will get treated in that way. Almost entirely elderly men who are at high risk because they're elderly and because they're male, something which we can't modify. In the UK, we took a different approach to this. We decided that this 10-year risk threshold was not appropriate for a prevention communication strategy. So we changed our thinking around lifetime risk exposure and metrics that would communicate to the public not only the risk that they had, but also the opportunity that they had with their personal risk factor profile to improve their future cardiovascular outcome. We developed a, a calculator as a collaborative process in new guidelines that allowed you to calculate your heart age in relationship to your risk factor profile. And we were able to show people in their 40s, for example, that because of their risk factors, their heart was the heart of a 54-year-old. Patients hated that from the word go. First question they ask you is, how can they get their heart age back down to their chronological age? A very good introduction to a good conversation. I like this one as well. This is a thermometer that shows you when you can expect to have your first heart attack or stroke with your current risk factor profile. We can then turn over here, alter the risk factors, and demonstrate to people 
that their heart age comes down and they extend their healthy life expectancy, avoiding cardiovascular events for another year, 3.7 years. Very effective communication, not just of risk, but also of opportunity. Now, we didn't do the trial we should have done, but the Spanish did it in general practice, comparing this type of communication approach to a classic 10-year risk framing approach and to no communication of heart disease. They did a randomized clinical trial in primary care, more than 3,000 subjects. Notice the mean age was just 46, and they had a conversation of them about heart age, framing and risk score or nothing, and they rechecked them 12 months later. Look what happened to the people who had the heart age conversation shown in yellow. Across the board reduction, substantial reduction in their cardiovascular risk profiles. If you communicate to people better, they understand and they start to do something about it. Now, this is all about the opportunity we have when a patient comes to us in our practices and we can do a one-on-one -on -one conversation. But clearly, we're not going to solve the health of the population just in our offices, in our clinical practices. We have to make people understand the scale of this problem and its relevance to them. These are recent data um, published looking at Google searches and what Americans actually die from, what they search for and Google about their health, and what the media thinks is important. These are the causes of death in the United States, and notice number one still heart disease, cancer second. Down here you've got a whole range of smaller uh, uh, disease um, for death. This is the Google searches by the American population. That's the amount they search about heart disease, not very much. They're still worried about cancer. They're worried about terrorism down here. They're worried about suicide and all these different things. This is the media coverage for health in the responsible newspaper, the New York Times. Almost nothing written about heart disease, cancer, lots and lots about terrorism and homicide down here. Not unreasonable uh, homicide, but look at this. No interest at all in heart disease. Now, in case you think that's an American problem, this is the equivalent UK uh, newspaper, The Guardian, the distribution of articles about health almost identical to the United States. The media doesn't think heart disease is important, patients aren't worried about it, and yet it's the commonest cause of death in the population. We've got to do something about communicating at scale the risk and the opportunity. So what we did was to take our heart age tool, which had been designed for doctor-patient communication, and put it online on the NHS website. We did a simplified heart age calculator, we launched it last year, and we got quite a lot of publicity in the UK media. Look what happened on the first day of the launch. Nearly four million people visited the app in the week following the launch. That's 5.9% of the UK population. Three million people calculated their heart age on the launch day alone. It crashed the NHS uh, website, it crashed the smoking cessation website, it crashed the uh, uh, obesity websites, everything crashed. They'd never had a response like it. And since the test has been launched last year, we're now about 5.5 million people have gone online to calculate their heart age. Don't let anyone tell you the public isn't interested if you inform them in the right way and you engage with them with metrics that they can understand. Now, everything I've talked about so far relates to general issues that will target the health of the population. It's a one-size-fits-all approach, and it's got its strength. We don't get access to symptoms, signs, and tests to assess the phenotype of our subjects. And we try to deliver best practice to everybody, which is uh, the, the, the goal of these sorts of approaches. But quite clearly, we've got to do better than that. We have to start to personalize medicine and get more precise in our risk assessment and start to focus the way in which we not only assess risk, but also target treatment. We've got lots and lots of new treatments emerging. We've got SGLT2s, GLP1s. We've got anti-inflammatory therapies. We've got PCSK9s. Extraordinarily expensive treatments. We cannot give these treatments to everybody. So we have to understand risk and individual risk in a much more sophisticated way. Now here, genetics, imaging, and biomarkers will really help us if we do this in a systematic way. 
We do this in our clinical practices already. We've talked about biomarkers specific to diseases. Imaging with CT scanning and the like really helps us refine decision-making clinical practice. I think this is the second area in which genetics is really going to change clinical practice and revolutionize medicine. Perry Elliott, when he was talking earlier, was talking about rare monogenic diseases which have a big impact and looking at the way in which we manage those. But every one of us has a range of genes that confer risk for different diseases. And being able to calculate a polygenic risk score gives us the opportunity to talk to the public in a way that tells them what they're scheduled to get in terms of risk in later life. This is something that has emerged from UK Biobank, a study of half a million people who have all been genotyped and in whom polygenic risk scores have been calculated. And it's been an absolute breakthrough in terms of our understanding of the potential impact. This was a study from Biobank looking at polygenic risk scores for a whole range of diseases, coronary disease, AF, diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, breast cancer, and the like. And looking at multiple genes contributing to this score, and looking at the impact in terms of risk of a gene score that's more than three times that of the uh, lower end of the population. 8% of the population have a polygenic risk score for coronary disease that confers them with at least a three times lifetime risk of developing a clinical problem. For coronary disease, very interestingly, the prevalence here is 20 times higher than the carrier frequency of rare monogenic mutations even the common ones like familial hypercholesterolemia, in terms of comparable risk. Now, this is important because those polygenic risk scores not only allow you to assess future lifetime risk or stratify risk, but allow you to look at the relationship between genotype and lifestyle. And this has been reported from the same data set for three different big trials. This is ARIC in the United States, the Women's Genome Health Study, and the Swedish Malmo Diet and Cancer Study. And what you see here is that people with a high genetic risk, not surprisingly, have a high 10-year cardiovascular risk score. But notice the impact of different levels of lifestyle on those outcomes. The high-risk people have the biggest benefit from having a favorable lifestyle. And you can compensate for having inherited bad genes by living healthily and getting your score right back down to the same level as people with low genetic risk scores. This interaction is very important and very important information for the public to understand to motivate them to do something about their behavior. Not only can we look at the relationship between risk scores and behavior, we can also start to stratify likely benefit from interventions like this study which looked at statin benefit. Again, demonstrating in various different trials, Jupiter, Ascot Care, prove it, that the people with the high genetic risk scores had the biggest benefit in terms of absolute risk reduction from prescription of a statin. Now, I mentioned at the beginning the opportunity that the digital era has given us, because for the first time, it becomes reasonable and scalable to take this sort of approach, not just to our individual patients, but out there to the medical, to the to the community and the population. We can start to make measurements of patient people's activity in a way that was unheard of years ago. We can start to interact with them in terms of behavior, and we can start to uh, collect data on them in terms of their risk factor uh, profile. This was an exemplar study that published in Nature two years ago, looking at 68 million days of activity monitoring by smartphone data in almost three quarters of a million people. We're really now beginning to get big data here. And what it described was the profile in different countries and different cities in men and women. It was able to relate the design of the city, the way in which the city functioned, and people functioned within that city to some of these activity data. Really fascinating information. We can use that information to start to begin to develop behavioral strategies to change people's behavior and affect their cardiovascular outcome. And this was built on uh, exactly those sort of data. This was a, a study that a health insurance company, Vitality, partnering up with Apple, delivered by giving a lot of people in the population an eye watch and said, you can have the watch providing you behave in a certain way and do as a, a, a minimum level of physical activity. If you don't, they took the watch away from the individual. 
That is good psychology. Withdrawal of a, of a benefit is much stronger as a, as a motivating factor than giving something additional. You can see that giving these people an iWatch for free, providing they behave in a certain way, changed activity, and that activity was maintained for up to six months and afterwards. The first evidence that we can now interact with people at scale in the population to develop a healthy behavior. We can do much more than that with more information about individuals' uh, uh, risks and individuals' uh, responses to lifestyle events. This was a, a fascinating Israeli study published in Cell looking at modeling of glycemic responses to different types of meals on a personal basis. They used microbiome data, blood tests, questionnaires, anthropometrics to deliver a predictive score for what would happen to blood glucose with a particular meal. And they were able to predict almost perfectly the response of an individual based on those collective measurements. We can start to tailor therapy to individual patients' responses and individual patients' risks. Now, in the UK, we're going to try to do this at scale in a very ambitious program. We have a number of advantages. We have lots of people with primary care health records. We have digital pathology for the country. We have cancer and cardiac registries. We have uh, government data, including employment history, that we can all link up. We have secondary care data through outcomes, and we have mortality data. And what we're planning to do is to construct a cohort of five million people in whom we do polygenic risk scores and repeatedly track those people over the next few years to understand the trajectories to disease and what we can do with a whole range of different interventions with industry and the like to try to change those trajectories. I'm going to end by saying that we are now in the middle or at the beginning of a revolution in the delivery of medicine. It's nothing less than that. And we all have to think about our role as expert physicians in that new process. It's no good being like the Victorian doctor you see here, sitting in your office and waiting for the sick to come to you and trying to do your best for them. That approach of disease management is important, but it's not sufficient. We have to get into the business of wellness maintenance, early management of disease, of risk factors and of behaviors, using digital technology to drive healthy behavior and hopefully prevent the development of intermittent illnesses. This type of approach has the real opportunity to alter the trajectory to aging and the development of non-communicable diseases. Now, you're probably thinking this is all pie in the sky. <coughs> As doctors, we can't do that without help. And there's no doubt that's the case. The good news is that the politicians, when presented with these sort of data, really get it now. And the partnership between politicians, healthcare providers, and the medical profession is a unique one in terms of really changing societal behavior. This is our health minister in the United Kingdom, Matt Hancock. He's actually a computer geek, which is a great advantage, and he really gets this. In November last year, he said if we get prevention right, it holds the key to a longer, healthier, happier lives and sustainable, high-quality healthcare system. Each year, we spend 97 billion on treating disease and 8 billion on preventing it. We must get smarter about where we focus our efforts and spend our money because preventable treatments cost less than retrograde treatments. That's what we were discussing in the previous uh, presentation. Preventable treatments done right and done economically are highly cost-effective and cost-saving. So I'm going to end by saying that we aren't anywhere near the limits of preclinical management of cardiovascular disease. We have to move from a disease care system to a wellness maintenance system. And that's going to take a fundamental change in approach from doctors in terms of our training, our practice. Politicians have to start to think about this. Public funders, private health insurances, all have to change their thinking about cardiovascular disease. And the challenge will be to develop partnerships, not only with these healthcare deliverers, but also the public and patients to provide the best and affordable care in the future. I'll leave you with a final thought Ernest Winder was a GP in the United Kingdom, and he said it should be the function of medicine to have people die young as late as possible. You certainly won't do that by treating the late complications of cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular disease, and dementia. We have to move our ambitions and our efforts upstream in terms of the disease process 
if we're going to try to achieve this. And that's going to be the big challenge for not only us, for our thinking, but also our healthcare systems and indeed our societies in terms to embrace this. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.